We continue our series from the book of Hebrews. We're up to uh, Hebrews chapter 1. So last week we looked at Jesus was greater than the prophets. And as I said last week, the people who were receiving this letter were obviously very, very Jewish. And there's a whole thing about being Jewish that was a, a quite an important part. Now when it came to angels, angels are that spiritual being that somehow linked you to God. And it's odd that there's no real part anywhere in the Old Testament or New Testament that really focuses on angels. There's lots and lots of snippets there, but no focus. And in some sense, angels are like uh, a piece of, uh, like a one-way mirror. They're on the other side of the mirror looking at us, and their devotion is us, and we just see the mirror. We don't look at them. So the Bible mentions those angels quite often, but the priority of angels is us. And so uh, this morning's topic is basically Jesus is better than the angels. Now the, the word for angel is the same word that we use for messenger. <coughs> and uh, there's a, occasionally this word, as in Genesis 20, uh, 32 verse 3, is actually used to refer to a human messenger. And so the word messenger has this double-edged sword. You know, is the word messenger a spiritual being or is it a human being referred to uh, when there's passages there? Now, typically the term refers to a heavenly being whose purpose was to serve the one true God. Now, depending on which Bible translation you use, angels turn up somewhere between 295 and 305 times in the Bible. In fact, there's 116 times we have angels mentioned in the Old Testament, 175 times in the New Testament. So the New Testament has a lot more angel mentioning. Now, of the uh, books of the Bible... 34 books mention angels. Now, depending on which you think is the oldest book, whether you think it's Genesis or Job, both of them mention angels, and they go right through to the last book, Revelation, angels. So all throughout Scripture, this spiritual being is being mentioned. And so when we talk about angels, there's a sense of saying there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. So who are the good angels? The good angels are the ones that remain obedient to God throughout all eternity, who carry out his will and desire to love and serve and worship him. They're the good guys. Now the bad guys are the fallen angels. So when Satan, who was an angel, falls, it says that one third of the angels in heaven fell with him and uh, they fell from their holy position and uh, who now are actively against the work of God. So that's the bad angels. So therefore, you say, well, then who are the ugly ones? They're the angels that are bad who pretend to be angels of light. And throughout Scripture, we're warned that uh, not everything that comes in a nice, pretty package is a present. And that the (coughs) purpose of angels, uh, or the bad angels, is to be deceptive and destructive on the Christian walk. So why do we uh, have angels, and what's our modern obsession? Now, if you like TV, there's one of the TV shows, Touched by an Angel. So uh, each week, these angels were supposedly meant to do something. Now, the show had nothing in common with the angels of the Bible. That's okay. Now, if you like uh, rock songs, one in 30 rock songs, modern songs, mention angels. So I was quite, I was quite surprised when I read that. But uh, angels seem to turn up all over the place. Probably 20 years ago, I did a website on angels just for fun. I just had a whole lot of Bob references. And uh, it quickly became one of the, uh, the top angel sites in the whole world. And uh, I had all these people who sent me these obsessive emails about angels and their names because a whole lot of people become caught up in spirituality. Because there's a sense that angels are spiritual beings, but they, on the whole, don't tell you to do anything. And so you just invent your own dialogue of what you think the angels are doing. And so we have a little bit about that. Now, before we look at the Hebrews chapter 1, let's just look at the background about what the Bible does say about angels for us. The first, that they are created beings. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are uncreated. But angels, like you and I and all of creation, has a starting point. <coughs> so back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. Now, hosts is one of the terms the Bible quite often uses to describe angels. So what does it say about angels in the New Testament? In Colossians <coughs> chapter 1, verse 16, referring to Jesus, For by him all things were created in heavens and on earth, 
the visible, the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for <coughs> him. And so there's a very strong sense that God and Jesus are creators, but the angels are created. And we have the term thrones, dominions, rulers and authorities. At that time, now the church in Colossae was caught up in New Age type teaching and in angel worship and all these type of things. And these were some of the terms that people would use to describe different categories of angels. And what's the Bible saying? Whether it's the biggest angel or the smallest angel, all made by God. The second thing we're told is that angels live forever. They are eternal. <coughs> so there in Luke chapter 20, it says, Jesus said to them, The son of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore. So angels do not have a death date. The third thing, of course, is mentioned there is they don't ever marry. So there's no husbands and wife angels. Now, if I said to my wife, oh, you're my, my sweet little angel, I'm actually probably not doing her justice because angels are described as masculine. Uh, we see them as being male and human, but they are also described as being angelic beings. And so uh, they'll use imagery of lions and stuff like that to describe uh, uh, angels. So if you go to Exodus, uh, sorry, Ezekiel chapter 1, you'll find a whole of imagery about angels there that look quite different. So when you say to my wife, my, my little angel, uh, read Ezekiel 1 and think, maybe that's the right thing to call a wife. Should you and I worship angels? People are obsessed with angels, but should we worship them? Now in Revelation 19 it says, Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, an angel this is. But the angel said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. So the angel very clearly says to John, Don't worship me. I am not worthy of it. So there's some of the things the Bible tells us as a glimpse of angels. So when we turn to Hebrews chapter 1, we'll get an insight to how Jesus and angels are quite significantly different. So the first thing we see there in Hebrews 1 is that the writer, as he, uh, uh, he's writing to Jewish people. And what would be the thing that Jewish people would respect most? Scriptures. We find in this uh, section of chapter 1, there are seven Old Testament passages that are quoted. Six of them are from Psalms. One is from 2 Samuel. But there's a sense of uh, the writer saying, I'm going to let the scriptures speak for themselves. Yes, he's writing God's inspired word, but he very much sees the Old Testament as God's inspired word that endorses his thinking. So the first thing is that angels are not God's son. There's a strong, significant difference. Yes, angels are spiritual beings. Jesus, before his coming to earth as a human, was a spiritual being. But they are not the same. So we find there in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, we get a quote, first of all, from Psalm 207. Then uh, the next quote is from 2 Samuel 7, 14. But before we look at this section, let's look at the verse just before this whole section, verse 4. Because it really is like, you know, it should be in bold as a heading. Hebrews 1 verse 4. Having been as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And so his whole argument is saying, this is why Jesus is so important to us. So we hear that angels are not God's son. So what does it say in verse 5? For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I'll be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And so the angels are created beings, but they're not family. So the first thing is that Jesus, as God's son, is different from angels which are just created. Secondly, as we said earlier, you don't, do not worship angels. So there in verse 6. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So the purpose of angels is not for us to worship them, but for them with us to worship God in heaven. 
But of course, that quote there is from Psalm 97. And so we had this very strong undergirding of Scripture. So what else does the Bible say about worship and angels? In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers. There's that very strong sense of the angels are not to be worshipped. But what do the angels do? If you go back to many chapters early to Revelation chapter 4, it describes some angels this way. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, all full of eyes all around them, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to is to come. The angels are worshipping beings who find their purpose in worshipping God. The same that you and I are worshipping beings. And we find our purpose and the sense of who we are when we spend time in worship <coughs> of God. Now, as I said before, the angels are like a, a one-way mirror. That you, that, that they watch us, but we're not meant to be watching them. And the Bible sees angels that their purpose is to serve. So in the next verse in Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verse 7, once more a quote from Psalm 104. And it says there, the angels, he says, he makes his wings, sorry, he makes his angels wings, winds, winds, and his ministers a flame of fire. And then in uh, Hebrews 1 verse 8 and 9, this is a quote from Psalm 45. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and had a weakness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And so what else does Scripture say on this topic? In 1 Peter 3, Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to <coughs> him? And so there's a real sense that angels are to serve, they're not to lead. And they actually find their purpose in helping us. The next thing that the writer of Hebrews wants to emphasise is that they are created beings uh, the same as the rest of creation. So they're in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 10, which is once more is a quote from Psalm 102. It says, And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe you will be rolled them up. Like a garment they will be changed, but you are the same, for your years will have no end. And so there's a sense that they are created beings, but God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit have no beginning and no end. I remember once uh, hearing this interesting story, this uh, young kid came up to his dad and says, did you know that God doesn't have a birthday? He says, what do you mean? He says, well, he was never born. So therefore we don't celebrate his birthday ever. And look, he was quite excited by that. And I thought that was rather cute as well. The fifth thing we're told is that angels do not rule. They are to serve. And so there in verse 13. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? We find the same theme is taken up in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Of course, sitting down was God saying to Jesus, your work is complete. But the angels were there to serve. And the next verse, verse 14, is quite a powerful one because it reminds us what angels are there for. It says, they are not all ministering spirits sent out to serve. For the sake of those who are to inherit salvation, they ministered to Jesus. And they minister to us. So when Jesus is in the wilderness, 40 days without food, Satan comes and has this massive battle with Jesus. What is the next thing we're told? We're told that the devil left Jesus, and behold, angels came and ministered to Jesus. Now, of course, in Psalm 91, it talks about angels, but this time about us. There in Psalm 91, for he has commanded his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. 
Now I read through about 20 different Bible translations just to see what other words they used other than ministry. Some said the angels come to care. Others that the angels come to serve. And imagine you, like I, have heard thousands of stories about people being protected by angels. One of the ones that I, I was quite delighted was, was that uh, in Africa, a missionary uh, was uh, under threat of attack by the local tribes people. And he knew that he had no weapons, he didn't have a gun. And if he had a gun, how many could he shoot if he started shooting? If the whole tribe was going to attack him? And so he was sitting out in, uh, in, just under, near his tent and just said, God, I'm totally in your hands. There's nothing I can do to protect myself. And he would spend all night in prayer. And at times you could hear people wandering around in the bushes in the outer darkness. It was quite chilling for him thinking, you know, at what point would a spear or an arrow go through his body? And each day the tribes people would come and look around his village and look around the, the campsite, look where the camp was, and they'd just look under things and stare for things. And this happened day after day after day. And after about four or five days, he asked them, he says, what are you looking for? We are looking for your soldiers. What do you mean? We came to attack you. And you had soldiers who were shoulders higher than any of us. And they were big and they glowed. And they were around the whole of your camp. And at that point, the missionary knew that he'd been protected by the angels. Now these other stories are many and diverse. But there is a sense that the angel's purpose is to look after us <laughs> and that God cares for us, that he does his utmost to protect us. How else are angels used? The seventh point is that God uses angels to proclaim his message. So we turn now to chapter 2 of Hebrews where it says in the first verse, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience receives a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? What does these verses say to us? Jesus is the source and the centre of our message. The angels came as messengers, but Jesus is the message they bring. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was tested to us by all those who heard, as it says in Hebrews. <coughs> now the whole world is under God's control. And all the angels are under God's control. But the world is not under the control of the angels. For in chapter 2, <coughs> verse 5, it says, For it is not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honour, putting everything in subjection to his feet. Now putting everything in subjection to him, you left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him. And so there's a sense that Jesus chose to leave heaven as creator, come to earth as a human, and came a step below what the angels were. Now imagine how shocked the angels would have been when <coughs> Jesus, who had been their creator, becomes a human. He takes a step back. Not only does he take a step back, but Jesus tastes death. Something that God or the angels would never comprehend. Why? Because angels do not die. But Jesus chose to be born and to die. Jesus coming to earth as a human is massively significant. But what is more significant is Jesus the human chose to to die. 
This is why the writer of Hebrews could say that Jesus, not angels, make our salvation. So there in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, For it is fitting that he, from whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing other sons to glory. And once more, this is a quote from Psalm 110, probably the most quoted psalm in the New Testament, where Jesus is honoured as victor over all. Then in Hebrews chapter 13, And to which the angels have ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for me. So what was the writer of Hebrews wanting to really get across to his audience? He wanted to really emphasise that Jesus was far more important than even the angels. And at times people have uh, captivated by what angels do or do not do. But the writer here is saying, don't worry about what they do or do not do. Think about what Jesus has done and what he has achieved. So there in chapter 2, verse 16, For surely it is not angels that he helps, for he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because of himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Angels don't grasp who we are. It says that they look with great expectation and interest in salvation because they cannot grasp how could God save us by grace. That there's absolutely nothing that we do to bring about our salvation. Like imagine if um, someone wanted to become a doctor and you just said, oh, that's wonderful, here's a certificate. You say, but don't I have to study? Oh, no, no, we just give, it to, I just give these out. But why would you give me that? It's grace. And you say, but I do not deserve it. How can you do this for me? You say, but this is grace. Now, if you love the internet, you might, like me, have regularly received uh, uh, people uh, contacting you. I had one this week, actually, who... He said, oh, have you heard about the latest scheme by um, Bill Gates? He's decided that he wants to give millions of dollars to a whole lot of people who are on the internet and are on Facebook. And uh, this person said to me, have you received your million dollars from Bill Gates yet? <laughs> and I quickly answered, yes, I have. I mean, I've, I've been spending my money and I bought a boat and I bought a car and I've, I've, I've done a whole lot of things. You know, how much money have you got so far? And uh, so we had this long conversation with this poor guy saying, what do I do? You, you're, you're telling me that you've got millions of dollars. When I'm trying to rip you off, you're turning, me, turning around and offering me a chance for me to get millions of dollars. So I was very quick. I said, all you need to do is, I'll give you my bank details and send me $200 so I know the money can get through to me. And once I've got $200, I'll send you a million dollars back. And sadly, they didn't take up my offer <laughs> of grace. So what is grace? Grace is getting what we do not deserve, what we did not earn, that we have no right to behold, because Jesus has done it all. So angels are not there for us to be captivated by, but to recognise that they are God's servants as we are God's servants, and their purpose is to care for us. (coughs) But our obsession should not be with them. There are people who are behind the scenes. Next week, we'll look at how Jesus is more than Moses. And so as the weeks go by, you'll see the writer of Hebrews is really trying to say to these Jewish people, all the things that you uphold and cherish and adore, they're okay, but Jesus is more significant than the light. Holding on to him is the most important decision of your life. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Father God, this week, use us for your kingdom. Let us be people of grace, as you are of grace. And as angels serve us, may we serve others who are around us and serve those in the church. Amen.